Welcome to another edition of EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author is Bob Dolan. His book is Life Lessons from My Life with My Brother Timothy Cardinal Dolan. And again, by Tao Publishing. Doug, Tao how Press you doing? is uh, the publisher. Welcome, Bob. Thank you very and much. And it's interesting. It, it's, is it unusual that you would write about somebody and the, and the author would have the same name? I guess so. But not in this case because you're his brother, right? So you don't get that often. You don't get an author no, with the same name as, as a subject. Not too many probably times, not, unless no. it's an autobiography or something. Right. And we probably don't get a lot of those either. Right. Now, this is a, this life lessons for my, for my life of my brother. Now, this isn't a biography of your brother, right? Not at all. I, I don't think, Doug, yet there's an official biography of Cardinal Dolan. There may be one down the road. I wouldn't be surprised. Right. But uh, no, this, this is just sort of some chapters of our lives mm -hmm. together as brothers. Right. And also, uh, I live in Milwaukee, and he was uh, right. Milwaukee's archbishop for seven years. So it's, right. it's the story of our lives as brothers and uh, as, as the seven years in Milwaukee. But you're not new to media, though. Maybe not no. maybe to publishing and writing, publishing, but not yeah. media, right? That explains the gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking to the choir. <laughs> no, I've been in media for most of my adult life. Right. Yeah, but this is my first book. Mostly TV, radio? A little, uh, a little of both, both okay. yeah. A little bit. Started in TV, moved to radio, okay. and uh, now keep my fingers in both a little bit. Now, you talk about your life, you talk about growing up in St. Louis, and then you talk about a period of time in Milwaukee, and then when Tim was in Milwaukee, and then obviously to New York, that's kind of the period that's sure. covered. And this is the latest, greatest edition, which yeah. includes all the information about the actual the consistory, which you were at, et cetera, and a wonderful group of uh, color pictures in the back that are included now, which were just added to the that's latest correct. edition that's of correct. the book, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the edition that's out now. That's the second edition, that's correct. Okay. The book has been out since September, and it's done right. very well, not because of the author, but because right. of the subject. Right. Uh, but now with the second edition, after the consistory, it's, it, we expect it to do very well. Okay, great, great. Well, let me ask you, too, because there's the St. Louis connection and then there's Milwaukee. Now, did you go to Milwaukee because Tim was in Milwaukee, or were you already yeah. there? I was already there, That's and I pulled I some strings and got him there. Okay. You know, I've got some Oh, so you, you were the one? Yeah, okay. yeah, I uh, texted the Pope a few times. And got, uh, now, uh, I, uh, I moved to Milwaukee in 1982, so uh, that's been my home for most of my adult life. Right. Um, and then, so I'd been up there 20 years or so before he was assigned as Now, there's a beautiful picture of your, of your wife and your, and your two kids, and you talk about dedicating the book sure. uh, to them, to, to Bear and KK, which are your kids, right? I make names, right. Okay, and to B is? My wife, Beth. Your wife. Uh -huh. Now, was Beth from Milwaukee? Or she is. She's okay. a Milwaukee girl. Yes. Did you meet her in Milwaukee? I met her in Milwaukee when okay. I was working TV up there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we've been married 27 years. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh -huh. And who's T? T is Tim. Okay. We have weird in, in the family. We have weird. You know, we uh, all of us are. Uh -huh. we, we sort of use initials for a, a right. nickname. Okay. Like I'm B on occasion. Okay. Uh, but T is Tim. Yes. Okay. I so obviously, I dedicate the book to him because without him, there wouldn't be a book. So are sometimes you and your wife B and B? We are. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Which is also a bed and breakfast. Uh -huh. Which is also a drink. Yeah. I was going to yeah. say. And and as you talk about <laughs> in this book, it's clearly a Catholic book. Yes. Because the idea of having a couple of Budweiser's or having a little white wine yes. or something stronger than that is not something that you shy away from talking about. Not at all. Uh, you know, that's not foreign to any Catholic. It's interesting that you bring that up because on occasion people who have read the book will say, uh, boy, there's a lot of drinking in the book. <laughs> well, from the author's standpoint, there's not a lot of drinking in the book. But that's just, you know, we're an Irish family right. uh, and born and bred in St. Louis with the, with the shadow of Budweiser right down the street. So drinking is right. a part of our everyday life. I don't think we drink to excess, certainly. Right. But there is some drinking in the book, and people have noticed it. And if you, if you know my brother, he certainly enjoys a cocktail every now and then. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you a question about, uh, you, you start off the book in kind of an interesting reminiscence that has something to do with Alfred Hitchcock. Ah. And there's a phrase here, uh, two phrases that I think are, seem to be important to this. One is, they tell each other that their father will never know. Mm -hmm. It kind of has a theological meaning there, too, That's I think, true. you know, yeah. in some way. And the other is, you forgot about Sam. That, that what was does the that mean? Now, do you remember the Hitchcock show? Yes, We're I do. We're about the same age. That's right. It was uh, Hitchcock's known for his movies, of course, right. but he had a TV show. Right, sure. And uh, one of those, you know, people, my, my brother's just just a regular fella, you know, so when, when we were young, we were watching the Hitchcock TV show once. We mm -hmm. weren't supposed to be watching because mom and dad were out bowling. Now, that was another thing See, that struck me. Bowling now, there's huge. another timepiece. Yeah. They were out bowling. Yeah. Do you ever hear? No, people don't do that anymore. When right. I was growing up, mom and dad were both in, in fact, a bowling league. Somebody wrote a book about uh, it was called Bowling Alone. Really? About the changing demographics in society. See? Yeah. 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 Oh, bowling leagues were hugely right. popular sure, back sure, then in sure. the 50s and 60s. Sure. So right. they're out bowling one night, which leaves my older brother Tim and my older sister Deb babysitting me. I'm about seven. I'm not supposed to be watching Hitchcock. 
but they let me watch Hitchcock. Right. And, and the particular episode was, uh, was uh, the killer was a, was a man dressed as a woman. Right, okay. And at the end, when we find out who the killer is, uh, the man takes the wig off right. and says to the final victim, uh, yes, you forgot about Sam. Damn right. Okay. And so I'm scared to death. I'm eight years old. I'm not supposed to be watching in the first place. I'm scared to death. So I, about five minutes after the show ends, I walk into my bedroom, which I share with my brother. Uh -huh. And the light didn't work. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but the light didn't work. So now I'm in this dark bedroom, and I hear the door close behind me, slamming shut. And I turn around, and there's my older brother uh -huh. with a mop on his head, so he's got the wig, with my mom's robe on, so he looks like a nurse. Mm -hmm. And he walks over to me like this and says, yes, you forgot what about, about Sam. And just just scared the living daylights out of it. We still laugh at that story 50 years later, mm -hmm. but when I was eight, it wasn't funny at all. Right, right. He was a good practical But joke. I was going to say, it's clear in this, in, this, in this book, and clearly his persona that people see of being a jovial personality yeah. is clear that that is not something that gets turned on when the cameras start rolling, no. right? He's always like that. I mean, you know him. Right. He's, always, he's one of the most joyful people I've ever known. Right. And now that's, that's just who he is. And even when right. he was a kid, that's right. who he was. Right. Yeah. Right. The nuns, the Irish nuns at our grade school, the Holy Infant, right. They still tell stories about he was he wasn't the class clown, mm -hmm. but he was like the class magnet. Everybody right. came to him. Well, you talk about later in the book, and I was when I was reading the book, and and there's a section here where you talk to him, and um, about the difference. What is it between humor and joy? Yeah, yeah. Well, right. that, that's from him, not from me. Right. Uh, you know, people always comment to me what a great sense of humor he has, and certainly he does. But. Uh, he, in my opinion, he uses his humor. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's part of what he does. He uses his humor to get you in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you like someone, you're going to listen to him. Right. So he uses his humor to A, get you to like him and get you to listen to him, and then he does what he does best, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is preach the word. Has he always done that, I mean, when he was a kid? Oh, yeah, he's always been the, the funny fella. Mm -hmm. he, I mean, his, his sense of humor is off the charts. But no, he's, he's always been like that. But there is a difference between, and in his words, in our Catholic understanding, uh, joy and humor come under the umbrella of hope. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, hope is, uh, he's, he's, one of the books about him is called uh, People of Hope or Person of Hope. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he explains in the book where, where right. we, we don't all have to have a great sense of humor, but we can all be joyful. Right. And there is a difference. And there's a difference yeah. there. Well, let me ask you about this. Here's a joyful uh, occurrence. You talk very early on in the book about when, you, when, when basically the word is out that he's going to the Big Apple, right? Uh -huh. He's going to the Big Apple. And this jumps out at me. You say, well done, I said to Tim. I am proud of you, but you ne better not become a Yankee fan. Yeah. Now, yeah. as a diehard Yankee fan, I take personal offense to that. Later on in the book... I wasn't thinking of you when Later I on in the book, you talk about how your ambition was not to be a priest, but to be a baseball player. Right. And one of the teams you said you would have been happy playing with with the New York Yankees well, or the Brooklyn or the Dodgers, not the Brooklyn Dodgers. That's correct. The yeah, Dodgers. LA Dodgers, yeah. But, but yeah. you decided since you lived near St. Louis, you would be a Cardinal. Yeah. So you wanted to be a Cardinal before Tim was a Cardinal. Uh, no question. Yeah. And he but beat Tim me too. never wanted to be that kind of Cardinal. Uh, in his early days, he, he did. did. He wanted to be Stan Usual. He did. Yeah. Okay. Well, everybody but, but, wanted yeah, to be Stan yeah, Usual. Yeah. Who doesn't? Right? I still do. Who is a very good Catholic. Yes, he is. Right, right. Better believe it. Right, yeah. uh, but I, I can hate the Yankees, Doug, and still respect them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so if I couldn't be a Cardinal, because I was wondering been fine. later on in the book <coughs> about you and Ada wandering around at the, what the first game at the new Yankee yes. Stadium that you happened to yeah, yeah, show that, up at. You didn't boycott the Yankees that, over there. No, that, 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 that happened right. to coincide with installation week in New York. Uh -huh. What are the odds of that? So uh -huh. I was at the very first uh, game in the new Yankee Stadium. I didn't get to any in, in the house of the Ruth built. Mm -hmm. uh, but the first one was cool. Right, yes, right. I haven't actually been in the new stadium. Haven't you? I've been yeah. in the others, but I have not been in, in that. Uh, they have new, a great hot dog at Yankee Stadium. stadium. Yeah. I love the hot dog. Okay. We used judge, to call we judge him, a used, ballpark. They, when I was there, he was called Reggie Jackson. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> who was there, by the way, when I was <laughs> right, there. Right, I, I saw in the Reggie, book yeah, that you, yeah. you met him, so, okay. So uh, you talk about here the position as Archbishop of New York being the American Pope. Does that add an extra pressure to your brother? Do you, did you see that weight come on his shoulders? No, no. no. I have never seen uh, anything uh, impact him. Mm -hmm. He's the same person no matter what. No matter what the setting, no matter who he's around, uh, he's pretty much the same. American Pope is a term mm -hmm. that most people in that position are given as Archbishop of New York. 60 Minutes, about a year ago, they did a feature on Cardinal Dolan. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, at the time, Morley Safer, the reporter, called him the American Pope. So that, that goes back... Uh, decades. Mm -hmm. But no, it, it hasn't changed him at all. Mm -hmm. 
Now, uh, we know about Vatican City. You want to tell us about Victor Court? Victor Court's where we grew up. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, our childhood and, our, and his upbringing is, is, is a huge part of, of uh, the man that he's become. Mm -hmm. uh, Victor Court was in Baldwin, is, Missouri. Is that some of the reason because those cultural pods don't exist as often as to why we have so many problems maybe in the culture in general but also in the priesthood or getting vocations? I think so. Because you're talking about a cultural vocation here. Yeah, I think so. Tim does. Yeah. You know, back then in the, in the 50s and 60s, he always knew he wanted to be a priest. And that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I, I, not to say it's not a big deal anymore, mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. But I think back then, uh, not when you knew that somebody was going to be a priest, uh, your family supported you, mm -hmm. the neighbors, the parish, the community as a whole, it was a huge deal. Now, especially mm -hmm. small town Baldwin, Missouri, this was tiny. Mm -hmm. This was about 45 miles west of St. Louis, and people were just starting to migrate out of St. Louis. So this was a small town. Yeah, so you were in the suburbs then. You were out of we town. We were way out. Right. Yeah, now, now it's just another suburb. Right, right. But no, we were way out in the sticks. So when, when word gets around that there's going to be a priest in the community, that's a big everybody deal. Everybody knows about so it. So everybody Because you it. talk about everybody. Knew everybody oh. in the streets. All these old stories that people don't believe are, are true. Oh. They think, oh, that's an old. No, no, no. But it was like that. You knew kids from three streets over. You knew their parents, right. their sisters, right. their nicknames, what they liked to do. Everybody watched well, out for everybody. it was fairly everybody. homogeneous, too, because a lot of Catholics, right? Yes. So, so the parish was very central. Yes, everybody as, had a lot of things in common. Them. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about this. Are, uh, are you an Oscar Madison type, or is just that Tim is more like a Felix Unger? Uh, we'd both be Felix Unger. Really? You're both well, Felix Unger? He takes it to another level. Okay. He makes Felix Unger look like Oscar Madison. Really? Yeah. We all got this neat streak in us. The whole okay. family okay. does. Where's it come from? Mom, dad? Probably dad. Okay. Yeah, dad was always very orderly, too. But Tim takes it to another level. Uh -huh. Everything, if you've ever been in his office, everything has to have a pile. Oh, really? And he knows, it's, I mean, he's got nine million things to do, <laughs> right. but he knows right where everything is. So it was tough to, when we were growing up, we, the three brothers, my right. uh, the younger brother, Pat, uh, we shared one bedroom, yeah. one small bedroom. And he was, Tim was always on us to make sure our things were in proper place. And uh, this was a thing about the three brothers, ultimately. You talked about when, when Tim, when, I think maybe when he became a priest, he was ordained. He would say, uh, as we walked out of church after Mass, I was about 14-year-old standing right next to my dad as man congratulated him without missing a beat when the man said to him, you must be very proud of your son. Yeah, this was right after my brother got word that he's being sent over to the North America That's College in Rome. And your dad responded, which one? I have yeah. three. And that, that, that still gets me when, right. I, when right. I recollect it these days, uh, because that was a huge honor. So I'm 14, my brother's 21, just got news that he's going to Rome for four years, mm -hmm. which is, you know, huge. Right, right, yeah, only the and top I, guys I go are to, selected, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, so I go to Sunday Mass with my dad, and this man comes up and sticks, Bob, you must be so proud of your son. And I'm standing right next to him. Right. And I know he's not talking about me. Right, I know he's right. talking about my brother Tim. And the first thing and on my dad's mouth is, which one? I have three. I mean, 50 years later, I still remember that. And you lost him very young at yeah. 51, and it was sudden, it was a heart attack. Yeah. And you were on the phone at home with the nurse. That's correct. And she told you what she shouldn't tell you, That's but correct. she told you anyway. That's right. She told me that my dad had passed away. I was, I was at home with my younger brother and younger sister at the time. Tim was at the hospital with my mom. And we were waiting for hours just to get word. A little different back then. It's yeah, 35 right. years ago. You right. didn't get instant communication. So, uh, so the, I begged the nurse on the phone because she had called looking for Tim. Okay. Where's Father Dolan? Right, where's Father Dolan? Okay. Because uh, he was a newly ordained priest at the mm -hmm. time. And I said, I, we, tell me something. Right. Tell me because we're just sitting here dying here. So mm -hmm. she told me on the phone that he had passed away. Uh, and then your other sister came in the door and she, she knew it. She knew somehow. Yeah, my mm -hmm. older sister who had just right. had a baby came in and she, she knew, somehow she knew that he had passed away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how did your mom handle that? Uh, she's still not over it. Yeah. She was a widow at 47. Yeah. And she never married again. Never married again. Mm -hmm. No. She's still she's still hanging in there. She mm -hmm. was in Rome a few weeks ago uh -huh. at the consistory. How old, how old she's was 85 she? She's now. 85 now. Yeah. Okay. Still gets around pretty well. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is the other thing. Uh, we, did did Tim play Rock'em Sock'em Robots with you, or is that a little? Bit uh, no, he in? did on occasion. Yeah. Remember so that game? So was he blue or red, and whose head got knocked off? Uh, first? My head always got knocked oh, off. Oh, yours got yeah. knocked off. Yeah. Okay. That's he always took the the good neck. Right. Well, this is the one that really <laughs> struck me. 
because you have to be the only other person who was crazy enough to buy that crummy electric football oh, game. Oh, my gosh. With the guys you'd put down with a little uh, little piece of cotton that was yeah. supposed to be a football, and you put it, and you'd turn it on, and it just would vibrate. It's horrible. And all the guys would go. <laughs> it was a nothing, horrible game. Nothing did you have happen. one? Of course I did. It was a horrible game. Yeah, it was terrible. Maybe the worst sports game ever. It looked ever. great on TV. They had this sure great thing. Oh, look at the face. Kick the ball. Sure. Score a field goal. And all it was was a vibrating thing <laughs> that you put these guys on, and they would go around and do actually nothing. And that was after 10 minutes of setup. <laughs> That's right. It took you 10 minutes to set up the formation for right. a play. Oh, and as yeah, soon as you turn yeah, the, yes. the click to, to on, they'd run in circles. Right, it right. was the worst game ever. Right, right exactly. <laughs> Now, when you were growing up as a, as a kid, you talk about in the book, not only for yourself, but, but that Tim had mentors. It was a couple of priests yeah. and a couple of sisters. Yeah. One was Sister Rosario and Sister Bosco, That's right? correct. They were all from Holy Infant. Uh, Holy Infant was the first Catholic school in Baldwin. Again, small town USA. Mm -hmm. And they staffed the school with nuns directly from Ireland. Mm -hmm. The Sisters of Mercy from Drogheda, Ireland, which is just north of Dublin. Were the Sisters of No Mercy, is well, that Well, in, in my case it was, because <laughs> they could be, <laughs> I'm not sure Tim ever experienced that. But the rest of us did. Well, you also talk about the fact that it's not always the best, uh, you or the other kids, to follow number one son. Yeah, I, you know, and a lot such of a star. A lot of people can. Relate and everybody's to that. like, "Oh, you're Tim Dolan's See, brother." Yeah. Hmm. I mean, you know, if anybody <laughs> the expectations has. Expectations oh, go very, up, right? very high. Right, right. My younger brother and I, constantly were asked mm -hmm. by the nuns in particular, but even the parish priest. So uh, you're going to be a priest too, right? You're going to be a priest too. Obviously, we thought about it. Right, sure. I, I think uh, many right. Catholic boys back then. Well, thought you wanted about to take it. up the collection, right? Wasn't I that did your indeed. Line? Yeah, <laughs> that's what you were interested. <laughs> My, uh, Tim went to mass <laughs> once with our grandma, Nani Lou, and he pointed at the priest. He's only five years old, and says, "When I grow up, I want to be him, right. looking at the priest." So, so uh, I went to mass with Nani about five years mm -hmm. later and looked at the guy with the collection basket and said, "I want to be him. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be the guy taking up the money." And you talk about the fact that they had, <coughs> they had an extra set of R's, right? They had the three R's, and then there was the fourth R. The ruler. That, that's where the Are you no familiar? mercy came in. Uh, vaguely, vaguely, yeah. vaguely. It's the things they could do with a ruler. <laughs> Remarkable. If just even just crack it and scare you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. They kept it as very similar to a desk like yeah, this. Right, right, and, yeah. and they kept it in the top That's drawer. Right. Anytime you heard the drawer right. open, all you had to do was get the reach. Somebody was you, in trouble. And you got so many times they didn't even, they just. They go, oh, they make, just, them, yeah. they make the move. <laughs> just and that was enough for everybody to go with it. <laughs> sure. uh, not me. <coughs> and were you along with Tim on this Halloween trip where you ended up with Pi Alamode in I a was bag? Not. That was Tim's story. That was Tim's story. The nuns directly from Ireland had no idea what Halloween was, mm -hmm. the, first, the first Halloween over. So they knocked, Tim was at the door, they knock on the door, trick or treat. And Mother Gertrude, who is the mother superior, says, well, I don't get what's trick or treat, what are we supposed to do? And mm -hmm. the, the kids in costume on the porch said, well, it's our tradition that we sing a song or tell a joke and you give us something to eat. Mm -hmm. and you put it in our bag. So she went back into the kitchen and got a freshly made apple pie and put apple pie into their, into their pillowcase and then followed up by a, a scoop of ice cream. Right, right, <laughs> they right. didn't quite grasp what Halloween was we supposed was. to be all about. Okay. Yeah. Now, later in the book, uh, this, you, you have in your chapter, it kind of talks about Christmas. And it's interesting because it's kind of like uh, a little bit of the dichotomy. Christ in our, Chris, is our Christmas gift on that life lesson because you like to celebrate Christmas right from Thanksgiving. I do. Right on. You want to jump in. Yeah. Tim has a little more of the older style yeah. with a little more of the Advent is supposed to be a little more penitential in the sense of preparing for Christmas. Right. And many people are concerned because what happens is, and the, the downside of not having the Advent experience is that, you know, Christmas hits and by then you're tired of it. No question. As opposed to when it's supposed to really be, be, no be question. beginning. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you have a lot of things about, you know, the Christmases in your family and even how you celebrate with Tim, what, the Eve of Christmas Eve? Eve, you Christmas Eve, 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 Eve right, of, right. Right. And what, what is the Ben story? Uh, the Ben story, his first parish assignment in uh, St. Louis, Amakalata Parish, and he went to the kindergarten pageant. And, you know, so all the proud moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas are there because their little five-year-olds are up on stage. And Ben happened to play the part of the last innkeeper who would say no to, to Mary and Joseph. Okay. So Mary and Joseph are walking, and they knock on the first day, uh, hi, my wife is pregnant, we need a place to stay, do you have room? No. Second door, hi, we're having a baby, do you have? No. So now they come to Ben's door. And, uh, and Ben's supposed to say, you know, no, we don't have room. So that's when they go find the manger. And they knock on it, and little Ben peeks his, peeks his head out the window, the fake window. 
and Joseph says, uh, excuse me, sir, but we've been traveling all night and my wife's gonna have a baby and we need a place to stay, do you have room? Mm -hmm. And Ben looks at it, looks around and says, sure, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he totally changes the, the greatest story ever told. Right. Uh, and, and nobody knew what to do, they're only six yeah. years old, they didn't know how to respond. So the teacher walks out on stage and says, Ben, no, remember you were supposed to say, no, we don't have right. room. And Ben looks at the teacher and says, but how do you say no to Jesus? Right, that's a great line. They brought the house down. Right. First of all, everybody laughed, but then according to my brother, you know, what, what a perfect message from a six-year-old. Right, and clearly know. even for, and certainly Tim didn't say no, but Tim also talks about a lot about the whole idea of our all, we're all called to holiness. We're all called to be saints, right? You better believe it. That's a it. big part of his whole yes. personal yes. spirituality. Yes, when, when he was installed as Archbishop of Milwaukee, his installation homily included the phrase, I want to be a saint. Mm -hmm. At the time he said that, now that didn't surprise me, I've heard him say that before, but this is a new crowd he's talking to. Right. And many members of the congregation started to laugh. They right. thought, oh, there he goes again telling another joke. Right. Uh, but no, he, he, we're all called to be right. saints. Yeah. We're all called to well, that Catholics life of sanctity. tend to see that sometimes in the past like presumptuous. Yeah. And a little bit of the Irish church tended to be, oh, you're being a little overly proud there, my son. Yeah. You know, that, you yeah. know what I mean? They have very much reserved. Sure. Kind of thing like those no, things. but he's as serious as can be, where he not right. only he wants to be a saint, but he wants right. to lead others to sainthood. Right. That's to, his mission. Not to drop back, but two things related <clears throat> to your dad that struck me too in the book, and we because in the chapter we, we talk about Robert Matthew Dolan Sr. Two images. Uh, one is the, the phrase that comes up basically, and it having to do with death, never enough time. Oh, uh, yeah. And the other one is the image of the empty wallet. Yeah, that's a tough one. And it's, a, it's surprising how many people, Doug, who have read the book, come back with that story. Mm -hmm. The never enough time is from a funeral. The, the chapter in, in the Life Lesson book is a, the joy of grief. And it was a, a funeral where I was out in the crowd and my brother was presiding. And the son of the deceased got up to say, you know, that with those you love here on earth, there's never enough time. He was talking about his dad who just passed away. You know, how I wish I just had one more Christmas, one more birthday, one more football game, one more barbecue. There's never enough time. So the son sits down after a moving eulogy. My brother then stands up and says, well, well said, I agree. However, there is one place where there will be enough time. Mm -hmm. And that's in heaven where with our loved ones, we've got all the time we want. Right. And it was just the perfect way to, to sum up a, what had already been a nice eulogy. The empty wallet was uh, days after my dad died, and again, he was only 50, and he, he, worked, he worked so hard for the family to put five kids through Catholic school. We never had any money. Right. Uh, and my brother and I, Tim, had to go to his work to uh, clean out his desk. We got home and we opened, you know, we opened his wallet, there's the driver's license and the health card, and, and we opened the pocket where the money's supposed to be, right. and it was empty. So on, on the day he died, he had nothing. Right. And yet, you know, we looked at each other, we didn't know whether to laugh or cry, right. um, but there's a great lesson in there. Right, there's you know, a certain what, level of self-donation. Exactly, sure. Right. I mean, He's what difference does it make? For his sure, family, there you right. go, there you go. So it doesn't, it doesn't make uh, any difference how much money you And, have and I think you that's make. sometimes a, a thing, and I, this is since I got out of the reading of the book of, when you talk about your dad too, is just the idea, that idea of seeing a good family man, a hardworking family man, who's out there earning a living, putting a roof over his family, that's a success. You better believe it, yeah. He doesn't need to be famous, he doesn't need to be on TV, he doesn't have to be on radio, he has to be a millionaire. Yeah, yeah. That's what makes him a success, See, having, yeah. having a great family. In fact, that's Tim's line too, that his greatest treasure really was yeah. having and being raised in the family no he was question. raised in, right? No qu now, you know, you say that with conviction, mm -hmm. and I certainly believe it, I, I wish more people did, right. you know. Especially, I mean, that was back in 1975. Right. I don't think too many people believe right. that anymore. Right. Let me ask you another question. Uh, do you still have a Philco television set? No, we don't. We don't. I've upgraded a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that was back, yeah. Well, Tim, I, I was reading here in that chapter where it says where Tim served Christmas Eve Mass for Paul the Sixth. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of funny. You don't think about these things and mm -hmm. think, wow, you mean back then? Right. Okay. He was a student in Rome at the time, mm -hmm. and he got to serve Midnight Mass for, that was his first meeting ever with the Pope. Right, so you got right. here. We gathered around our Philco television set at 5 o'clock on Christmas Eve afternoon, midnight in Rome. We saw John Chancellor. There's a name for yeah. the past. Yeah. NBC News introduced the coverage. And the other funny part was, didn't your mom call, who is it, your dad's mom to say? Uh, no, her mom. Her mom yeah. to say, oh, we got to watch Midnight Mass. And she, she said, well, that's too late for I me. I can't stay up for midnight. Yeah, she didn't know about the time. And your dad said, no, 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 it's yeah. at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. It. Yeah, yeah, she'll be fine. It'll be yeah. okay, right? Yeah. Right. So. <laughs> a lot of, you, you mentioned the Philco TV right. set. One thing that I get from a lot of readers is it's sort of a nice walk 
through memory lane mm -hmm. for, for all of us, right. you know, people of our generation, sure, right. that, that, that many people can relate to the stories I'm telling. They'll, they'll say, that's just like our family. We right. used to do that too. Now you have one other point here, just as we're getting near the end, you talk about at the beginning of a chapter that there were, what, two times in your life that you were able to tell your brother what to do. Uh huh. I can't remember what they are. Oh, the, the, well, the final chapter, which right. is called Roadmap, when right. he sort of just wraps up everything for us, which is my favorite chapter. There, there, there's some amusing stories in here, but I think the, the nuts and bolts of the book is just his, right. his uh, guidelines for us how to, how to live uh, more holy lives. Right, and in a section where there's humor, there's hope. We're sitting in his New York home office when I gave him those marching orders. I enjoy telling him, Tim, what to do. I've done it perhaps twice in 50 years. Both times were a thrill. <laughs> and I remember both times. Right. You don't get to tell a cardinal too often what to do. Right. Yeah. I think the other time was you better go turn the meat on the barbecue yeah, bed. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, there's wonderful pictures in there. There's a picture of your dad when you were kids yeah. in there too. People could see in black and white and there's some wonderful color pictures and pictures of your family growing up. Uh, has anything changed at all in your relationship with your brother since he's become, whether when he first became a priest to when he became a bishop to became a, a cardinal? It has. Okay. Uh, but it didn't change until he came to Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Because before Milwaukee, this was 2001, I believe, when he came to Milwaukee, uh, we had not lived in the same city for about 35 years. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So two brothers. And it's seven years apart. Seven so, years right. apart. You know, he, he went off on his right. life, I went off on mine. So we'd really only see each right. other three or four times a year, and that was always with family functions. Right. So when he moved to Milwaukee, that's our relationship. Right. We were always very close, don't right. get me wrong. But uh, Milwaukee was a gift from God, right. where he got to know me better and my family, right. uh, vice versa. So our relationship now is very strong. That's great. And I tell you, in reading this book, I think a lot of people will come to have a relationship with the Dolan family, certainly with Tim Dolan. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Doug. Very nice My honor to be book, here. Thank uh, you. About your brother. It makes you want to know him better, actually. Uh, talking here with the author, Bob Dolan, talking about the book Life Lessons from My Life with My Brother, Timothy Cardinal Dolan. And it's Tau Publishing, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. I highly recommend this book. I highly recommend it. Join us next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark. Thank you.